Hello, welcome back. This is the Ivory Tower. On many measures, Timor-Leste is a country in need of development and economic independence. 42% of the population live below the poverty line. Life expectancy is only 67 years and well over half the adult population is illiterate. But development in Timor-Leste has particular challenges. And to help us understand them, we're joined by Kate Neely, a researcher at Deakin University, and again by Associate Professor Michael Leach. Michael, why is development such a challenge in East Timor? One of the things to remember is that East Timor is a very young nation. It's only been independent for 12 years. At that point, um, the departing Indonesian forces had destroyed a lot of the infrastructure, so they really started from ground zero. That's one challenge. Uh, the other one is that it's predominantly a subsistence agriculture society. By that I mean that the average economic activity of 70% of people is to grow food on their own land to feed themselves. So it's a subsistence economy and obviously there's some developmental challenges there. Kate, um, Kate is there a sense of um, dependence in East Timor? Is there a, an emerging culture within East Timor of self-reliance? I think there's an emerging culture of self-reliance. The Timorese people um, are really incredibly um, able. They're, they're quite passionate about surviving on their own. They don't want a lot of assistance from outside. Um, so for, for villages where people are, as Michael said, subsistence living, they're also trying to sell into the markets. They're, they're earning at least a dollar a day in most cases now. Um, but out of that, they need to provide themselves with water and electricity and a whole lot of other things. So. Well, can you give us some examples of development that is working? Development programs or projects that are showing us a way forward and, a, and there is a future? Um, look, good development in East Timor looks a lot like um, very much small level community development, so where communities are given the opportunity to say what they need, what they want to work for, how much time and effort they can put into actually achieving particular outcomes. So, um, for example, I saw a really great example of a solar pump being used to provide water from a spring, which would have been used anyway, but the water was, was coming um, close to the house to nine houses, a really small system, um, but with really passionate people wanting that water, knowing that that water was making a big difference to their lives. They didn't have to walk to the spring anymore, which you know is a good hour walk in a lot of cases, and they didn't have to carry 20 kilos of water back on their backs. Michael, do you find things working and not working? Well, I mean, the, big, the big challenge for East Timor to go from the micro to the macro is that they've got currently $15 billion worth of reserves from their oil and gas revenues, the contested oil and gas revenues in the Timor Sea between Timor and Australia. Is this the $15 billion that they know they've got or $15 they billion they might get access there to? There might be more depending on the outcome of certain um, contests in the International Court of Justice, but at this point it's $15 billion. The real challenge for Timor, that will run out. <coughs> it's a finite resource. How do they develop sustainable other industries while they have this money before it runs out? Ones that will continue to earn revenue for the country after the oil and gas revenue new era ends. So what is in this emerging economy? What sort of things can they look at as being successful? Well, um, it's overwhelmingly dominated by oil and gas. So 95% of the GDP of East Timor last year was oil and gas. It, that makes it the second most dependent country in the world on oil and gas revenues after South Sudan. And the next one is coffee exports, which is um, a fair whack of the remaining 5%. Mm. So there's a lot of challenges there for developing sustainable industries after the oil and gas runs out. Well, let's talk about some of those. What are the challenges? How do they make sure this resource, this money, sees them well into the future? Look, I think part of it is to make sure that money gets to the places where it's needed the most. And one of the programs that the government has at the moment in Timor-Leste is called the PNDS, where they're going to put $50,000 to each suco, so that's a large village area. Um, so $50,000 to each suco where the suco will determine for itself what that gets used for. So they will determine their own, um, their own development goals. Do they need a school? Can they pay their teachers with that money? Do they need a water system? What will they do? And I think that's really good. That's a, that level of self-determination means people will stand up and be really responsible for their own development. And is community empowerment uh, a, a new phenomenon or is it something that's always been the case in East Timor? It's certainly new, I think, uh, in many cases. S communities are more resilient than empowered by government. So right. those, those communities that Kate is talking about have been there for hundreds of years, governed in much the same way, and having a relationship with the external state, be it Portuguese, 
Indonesian or now independent. And the question is, what can the government do for those very resilient communities that can really, in many respects, look after themselves? But how can they lift their living standard to the next level? Are women empowered in this process? Um, a, a lot of the NGOs that are working in East Timor are working uh, strongly with women to make sure that women are well educated and that they do have the power to, to stand up and, and ask for what they want and to, to work towards what they need. Um, at the moment, there, there's still some doubt as to, you know, that works differently at different levels. So in Dili, it's quite obvious that women are quite empowered. In smaller remote villages, a lot of the women will sit very quietly when you're talking, but they'll come up and talk to you later and they have great ideas and they have a lot to say. What can Australia do to assist development in East Timor? Well, Australia could, um, the Australian government could um, do a fairer share of the future oil and gas revenues in the Timor Sea. Uh, I think, well, if you took a median line between the two countries, a lot of what Australia claims today would be in East Timor is exclusive territory. Australia has a median line agreement with New Zealand and also with Papua New Guinea, but not with uh, East Timor. Leaving the Timor Gap Treaty aside for yes. a moment, what else can Australia do to assist <coughs> development? Look, um, there's a lot of good person-to-person uh, -person programs. The, the Australian friendship groups are very, very effective in, in forming a relationship with local communities and that Kate's been talking about. So you can certainly, if you're an Australian citizen, get, get involved with a local friendship group in this country. Kate, have you got any suggestions? Uh, look, I, I think Australia needs to be patient. We need to not have the expectation that Timorese society will look like an Australian society. So a lot of development um, is, is about trying to make something that looks like what we're accustomed to as opposed to understanding what the social situation is and actually working within that situation. Kate Neely, Michael Leach, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank this you. is the Ivory Tower. We'll be back with more in just a sec.